And if I forget to shout during the talk, just shout back. I'll speak up. And sorry if my very voice goes during the presentation. I've got some slight cold. But hopefully it's going to be fine. Uh, yeah. Oh, I stopped imagining this. These slides are all written in English. And the fact it's a JavaScript, I keep being asked, is this presentation actually written in JavaScript? The answer is, I inherited so much legacy code from the guys at Google who wrote the original template. That nah, didn't bother. But it's all web technologies anyway. Right, let's get started. This is a talk about copyright in case you haven't already noticed. And my name is Budim Stoka, and this is my Twitter handle if you can see it. It's, I make sure to, to put it on the first slide so you can tweet during the presentation how awesome it is. Uh, and as you mentioned, I work for a company called Stereo, which is, I think it's a French company. I live in, in Oslo, Norway, and I work for the Norwegian branch. And they very kindly paid for my trip here. So, that's very nice. Um, JavaScript. How many of you guys know JavaScript already? Most of you, that's very good. Because um, this, this presentation is written kind of from the perspective that you know JavaScript. So it might be something tricky for those of you who, who aren't too familiar with it. But if you're all developers, you should be able to, uh, to follow most of it. Um, so if you've written a lot of JavaScript, you know it's kind of me. Uh, there's a lot of boilerplate, it does a lot of strange things. Um, yeah. So, I'm trying to remember how this goes now. Um, I'm supposed to do a history lesson, that's right. Um, JavaScript. If you know a company called Netscape, you heard of those. No hands. <laughs> That's fantastic. I mean, I, I, I thought I was speaking to my own generation. And I actually was the first But I see a lot younger than me. That's great. Anyway, let's get to a company that have been uh, rising at the time that later became the same. And they were kind of pioneers at the time um, of web technology. And at some point in about 1995, they realized HTML and Python isn't kind of too exciting. Um, you can't do too much of it. You can make these forms and then you can get some kind of interaction by, you know, passing the form back and getting the page back. Which, you know, that's not too exciting. So then, um, they decided they needed me, that they needed a scripting language for browser. And they hired this guy, Brendan I, um, to write the, the interpreter for this language and the design of this one. Brendan was originally hired to, they didn't specify what kind of scripting language they wanted. So Brendan suggested, um, okay, let's do a scheme interpreter, which would have been an ASCII agreement. Um, unfortunately, um, you know how it goes. Uh, corporate minds change. And they decided, well, Nesquik was talking to this other company called Sun at the time. And this being a Java conference, for the most part, you should be familiar with Sun, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they had this new, new technology called Java. And at the time, for some reason, Sun had this great idea that um, Java should be on the web. You should embed a Java virtual machine inside the browser so you could run these things called applets. Do you remember applets? Yeah. Yes. Yes. I have played that. <laughs> right. Um, I think they're actually still alive, but they didn't really catch up. Um, but as they were building their own scripting engine as well, they wanted to please some, and they went to Brandon and said, 
yeah, this steam thing is great, but can you maybe make something more like Java? And could you please hurry up about it? <laughs> and as you can see, um, Brenda was given the story varies one or two weeks to create this new language from scratch. And he had to throw out everything he had, he had done so far. Um, and the result of this JavaScript. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's a great language, but it's got these strange bits to be just mightily. Um, for instance, this global variant thing. Um, it's that actually. That's a problem with using. I have to use Firefox to present this, and normally a Chrome uses that. And my Firefox does strange, strange things sometimes. Um, because of Gillis Grip. It's because of Gillis Grip. Yes. <laughs> Which does not do this kind of thing. 
So best practice in JavaScript is to always use the triple equals, because that always does what, what you expect it to do. Mm. Yeah. And oh, my absolute favorite part, this isn't, JavaScript isn't the only language with this problem, but not a number, it's a number. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
assess a variable, if you try to assign a global variable without declaring it first, you're going to get a reference. Where's the play? It doesn't work. And the lip set is quite simply removed when it wants it. But it's in JavaScript. And the next slide. Um, I mean, you know, knows of JS. There was a presentation of it yesterday. In, in Node, you're starting to notice what's, what's hurting about JavaScript. Um, oh, I actually mentioned Node is crazy by this guy called Ryan Dark. That bit is something in recently group. Um, <laughs> not because of this presentation, but it helps. Um, Yes, and um, Node is um, designed for writing a very efficient server-side code in JavaScript using mostly um, closures and, and callbacks. So, Node code looks kind of like this. This is, I made this up, but it's very close to the truth. Um, to produce a web page uh, which does an SQL query and um, writes the results back to the to the user. This is what it looks like, and these are like five, six lines of the of the nested callbacks. It looks really bad. Something to be a bit of real. Um, yeah. Now it's time for some live live code. So I'm gonna have to sit down. So it's gonna be, um. Let's see if we can Im improve on this a, a little bit, make it somewhat more readable. Um, by basically taking things away. What's, um, there's one thing we can do to this code to reduce it a bit with, without it becoming not JavaScript. If you get what I'm saying. Um, there's one thing that's optional in JavaScript. That's the center. So I'm going to take that out. That's just in the way. Now this is the JavaScript. But let's go a bit, a bit further. Let's say uh, function calls, do they really need those parentheses around the arguments? Nah. <coughs> let's see if that happens. Notice by the way, function calls are not uh, function definitions. Let's see what it looks like, can't you? It's pretty obvious it's going to be a if not necessarily to a single point. Um, yeah. That's a lot more real already. But let's go a bit further. Let's say there's one thing I really hate about, about JavaScript is the function keyword. Let's drop that. Instead of um, um, a keyword, let's do this. Let's say a list of parameters and this nice little arrow, that's a function definition. Let's do that for each case. Yeah. Like that. And one final thing. Um, if you suddenly talk about Scala this, this morning, um, you notice that in Scala, everything returns something. And let's 
assume every statement returns something in, in our new language as well. So we can just drop the return statement here because that's implied. If you just write an expression in the function word, that's what's going to be returned. And that, in fact, is Scott's script. Pretty good Scott cat. I don't think it's that far. I'm going to see you. Right, so Scott is great. It's created, it's the pet project of this guy, Jeremy Ashton's, who created that. The pet project of this guy. You've noticed something, haven't you? Yeah, so that's no bad. So I was advised, um, the last time I gave this presentation, I concluded that the theory must be false. <laughs> but actually, Jeremy, uh, Jeremy read my slides and pointed out that, in fact, if you look closer, <laughs> there's a the whiskey moustache. <laughs> Sometimes you have to the limits nested function calls. Or what I'm trying to say is that if you're having a function as a parameter to another function, and the return value of a function as a parameter, you sometimes have to put these parentheses in to make them quite get it. And if you want to call a function with no arguments, you have to remember to use them. Because this is just the function. This is the function and this is the call to the function. Because in JavaScript, you know, um, functions are the class objects. And the function is different from the call to it. So let's just try that. It's a live game. This is how you do it in JavaScript. See if it's fine. And this is copy scripts. Notice um, on the right hand side, I've kindly provided a real time um, JavaScript uh, 
JavaScript compiles down to JavaScript, so this is uh, the JavaScript as I type it. You'll notice, um, okay, I just realized you know, this is a bad example because it looks exactly the same in JavaScript. But you notice um, in JavaScript there's some to the pre as you'd expect. If I remove the brains, it's exactly the same. Just to so you believe this is line, and then change this to four, and you see it's four in the JavaScript as well. Right. Very simple. Um, you remember this JavaScript issues. In CoverScript, every assignment is, is local. <coughs> if you assign something to a variable, it will automatically declare it for you. The ball well, is uh, automatically generated. And there's no problem. There are no problems comparing things. The CoverScript equals equals always compiled to the JavaScript script equals, which is the one that makes sense as a group of And the way statement doesn't exist at all, just like in, in script map. Yeah. I like my cats. Um, let's look at declaring objects. In JavaScript, you might know, objects are just basically hashes, um, hash maps in Java work the same way as JavaScript objects. So every every attribute, every property, every field, whatever you'd like to call it on, on a JavaScript object, it's just a key in a hash map. And um, if you know JSON, this is going to look very familiar. We're declaring objects here called Wint, with two fields, user and text, and user happens to be another object and it's been inside. In CoverScript, we do it like this. This, um, you notice if you know YAML, this looks a lot like YAML. And it's very convenient and readable. You don't need the code embraces on big things. Arrays. Arrays in JavaScript <coughs> are interesting because they're really sorts of objects. Um, originally, Arrays were just objects with the indexes as keys. And modern browsers, modern, modern JavaScript engines tend to optimize that, unfortunately. But anyway, so this is how you declare an array. This is basically a list of, of objects, a list of items. Um, this is the JavaScript version, and here's the script. You notice it's more free form. Um, you don't need comments if you don't want them. Though you could put all this on one line with commas in between, for instance. Um, and then that was the interesting spot. Because Gospel adds a few um, new features to the language. And destructuring. Um, Python does this a lot. Probably a lot of other languages too, but I know about Python. And the thing is, you can assign variables from inside arrays. This here is a function that takes two numbers and then returns an array containing the sum of these numbers and the difference. And what I'm doing afterwards here is I'm assigning the variable sum and difference to the array. So it CoverScript unwraps this for you. I'm going to show you how so it's very hard to, to just explain what I'm showing you to. Right, I'm going to show it to you right now. Suppose I call this function, uh, let's say I use numbers 5 and 3. And I run this code, it returns 8 and 2 as a list. Now, if I do the assignment, sum and diff. If I run this, it's just going to return the list. But let's, let's examine what happens. Uh, by the way, um, the, return, the return value you're seeing on top is just the result for the last line of my, of my code. So let's just illustrate if I type 5 here, it's going to return 5. But I want to look at what sum is. Sum is 8. And diff, sorry, diff is 2. And notice 
is that the JavaScript code, what, what's happening there? Uh, let me try and show you. Uh, notice the assignment to the underscore ref thing, that's just a placeholder. Uh, that's the array. And then some is being assigned to have the first item of ref, and this is the second item. So this is a shorthand for, for pulling values out of arrays and assigning them to variables so you can continue working. And interestingly, this is the cool part. You can do the same with objects. See if I remember the notation for this. So first, I want to extract the text from this object. I will type text to a text equals tweet. Run that, you notice it returns the object. But if we examine the text variable, you notice that's the text feed. And you're going to be typing this a lot. Um, you're going to be repeating this hand a lot if you use this. So constant has a shorthand. If if the field and the variable you're assigning you're assigning to um, have the same name, you can just skip it and go next and it still returns the field. Right. But we can go deeper than that. Sorry about the gratuitous inception reference. Let's Instead of, of just getting a field of the object, let's go a bit deeper. If I remember this, I will try it. And this, it compiles, so I think I got it right. Let's see what name is now. It's the name field of the nested object. So this can get very interesting. Let me just. Not that my blood is more often than the scarlet of the top of the 
Let me just show you very quickly. Um, let's find out what's the best Pokemon. It's the Mudkey. Very simple um, property access. Now, suppose we comment out this. So, Pokemon is undefined. That produces an error, as you expect. Pokemon is not defined. Now, Existential operator. Look at the JavaScript code. Um, <coughs> I'll scroll this way. It automatically creates uh, an object, kind of. It checks if this is not null and not undefined before it tries to access the property. Let's run it. It goes undefined instead of crashing. That can be useful. Especially combining that with, with the destructuring for working with huge JSON trees. String interpolation, uh, very quickly. This is something we said from Ruby. Um, though, I think last time we gave a presentation and I said this was something from Ruby, some guy in the audience chanting, <laughs> and that might be true, <laughs> probably. Um, I've heard lots, lots of cool stuff, I just don't know what I'm saying. Um, but the idea is, um, you can kind of run code a string and how it's automatically inserted by using the, uh, the hash curly bracket notation. So I define the variable Pokemon and you just get that inside the string. Or as it's actually code, you can even run um, functions inside it. If you know Pokemon, you know that um, when a Pokemon, or when a Pokemon appears in the game, the, the Pokemon's name is always an uppercase, and so it is. Um, let's uh, do this. Let's go a bit deeper again. So we have a sweet, sweet object. Let's say we want to format that for our outputting on the web page very simply. Something like uh, you get the idea. Let's do that as a string. Using string interpolation. Uh, the JavaScript again. It's just constructed a series of string initials automatically. Run this and it becomes a string of all it. <coughs> and a bit more about strings before we move on to the heavy sheet. Um, you can just write really long strings if you want to and it's, let's say a doc string. And JavaScript is going to concatenate them for you and try to do what it thinks you want it to do. In this case, um, we had three lines of text that just adds them together. The huge library space thing becomes just a space. Um, you can also preserve this by using um, here docs, which is once more something I thought was there for Python, but it's actually a compact. Um, this Service formatting, and you can write anything in this as long as it's not a triple double point. So you can, you can put sort of complex uh, HTML inside this with voice and everything and not worry about it. Let's just say my syntax highlighter doesn't understand this, but I then Google it because I've written by Google. Uh, but the script really does understand this. So the, the, the word article here is actually part of the string, it's not a syntax. Um, arrays. We can use slicing uh, very easily. In JavaScript, you have to use the, you remember the slice function. And um, it's, it's a bother. You can just do this directly by doing this range location instead of just accessing one index, so you can get a lot of that. And uh, furthermore, suppose you wanted to to get, say, the, um, from index 7 to just the end of the string, without the end of the list, without knowing how long the list is. That's, in JavaScript, you have to read the length of the list and insert that as a parameter and it's very well And of course, you 
classroom just as nothing like this. And this is the cool part. You can splice things back into the list. Using the same notation, you can assign to the range you have selected. And it changes the list. I'm gonna just do this in code for you. It's a lot easier to see. We have a list of numbers from zero to nine. In fact, uh, the classroom has a short hand for that. Because like this is the same list. Um, just to illustrate this an example. So that's what they say. Gives us the, the numbers from three to six, as expected. Or from three to, to the end without knowing what the end is. Or from the end to five. Yeah, it works. Now let's assign something back. Take the numbers from three to six. Let's make them the word boom and boom and bar instead. Let's just look at numbers now. What's happened to it? Notice that. That's pretty cool. In fact, um, it produces basically the uh, slice and splice. Just trust that Comscript takes care of it. For loops are interesting. Uh, the for loop in JavaScript looks like C. It hasn't changed a lot since. Going in and which you originally decided this makes sense to them, if not to us. But um, in Java, you know, you have the, a different for formation for iterating over arrays or connections. And you can do the same in, in JavaScript. In JavaScript too, for that matter. Um, by using this for x and y. And of course, um, as with in the wild, you can put the before and the end in the backwards. more we need to. That's the same thing. And this is the awesome bit. It, of course, returns something and it returns a new list. This is a very basic example. It takes the list numbers and adds one to each entry, and it becomes a list of numbers plus one. Let me show you. If we run just a, a four, it, it's going to, in this case, I just return the number I get. It returns the same list plus two. That's, yeah, you get the idea. <laughs> Multiply by two. See? This is kind of this comprehension, or comprehension. Um, but you can do the same with dictionaries. In fact, um, these are real abbreviations. And the object management group, I should mention, is uh, the standards body that's now taking care of UML. You all know you're not right. So OMG, that's a really appropriate abbreviation. WT can be a lot better than that. Anyway, uh, let's let's follow it over this one. Oh, key of dictionary. Notice the difference. I use of instead of in, because in it breaks over the indexes of an array, and of it breaks over the keys of an object. Let's return key just to see if that works. And of course, uh, this won't be so very useful unless you could look at the values as well. Let's iterate on key and value. Just return value. It works. Or even better, key plus value. Please don't really know what it does what you expect it to. Um, everything's better when you shout. Um, I talked about this comprehension. One of the coolest features of, of Python when I discovered it, and lots of other languages have this too. Scala has it, but that's it. Uh, most lists have it. Um, I'm told it's even, it's even going to be in part 6. Quite a shame, probably I'll catch up with it. 
Um, basically, this is uh, this is the shorthand for expression with parentheses around it. So you can just uh, put it inside another expression. Oh, and um, the same thing with the op orientating other other keys and objects. Here's a dictionary. I'll cling on to English. Hello is ne. Yes, it's picha, and so on. Let's play with us. Uh, uh, oh. Let's play with that as this comprehension. Let's just do, uh, let's say, E for E and K of dictionary. E for English and K for K now, very obviously. So we get a list of the English words. Let's say we want to cling on words. There we are. Very obvious so far. Let's um, add the when clause. Uh, you can filter this list as well. Not just, oh, uh, by the way, we are, of course, uh, modifying this if we want it.
from Java, we have an extends keyword now, which takes a class and extends it to make a subclass. In this case, uh, we're adding a radius to the constructor. Let's see how that works. We get, uh, we call the superclass for x and y. Oh, and we have a super, superclass um, accessor in JavaScript. This is really a bit to do in JavaScript. We have to you have to get the process like that and make sure you call it on the particular class you're inheriting. You have to type the class name and everything. It's horrible. And guys, you're just super. Um, yes, and notice the active front radius. Now let's do the area method real quickly. That takes the parameters. How do you calculate the area of a circle? Anyone? Or uh, somebody yeah. answered in French, I'm sure it's correct. <laughs> I'm just, <laughs> just going to do that. Math dot pi times radius squared. I'm just going to do radius times radius. This dot radius. So let's see. Circle dot area. you that we're calling the superclass method here. Yeah. It returns the, the <coughs> center point. Now I'm calling area, which which is defined to return zero in superclass. We have that and we get 78.539 or seven, which is pi pi squared. And that's how you do object implementation in CompSquare. Let's see it. I have time to tell you about how you can use this. I think we're really running out of time. So, in the, in your web page, it's really simple because the computer distribution comes with a file called JS, which, if you load that into your page, it's going to add a CoffeeScript compiler. So you can just go, instead of typing text JavaScript, text CoffeeScript. And this is going to be automatically compiled and then inserted in the usual script. In Node, you just send the MS or coffee script, and the MS the package manager in Node if you this tree of the file. And then magically, uh, Node will know how to compile a coffee script file. You just include it in a regular way using the require, and it works quite simply. And um, this package also includes a, a, a file called copy, which is a compiler which just takes CoffeeScript code and compiles it to JavaScript. So, it, it, in essence, if you can be bothered with a compilation stack, you can use CoffeeScript anywhere that JavaScript would, would run. I actually use this in Adobe Air for all the straight platforms I can imagine. Um, but anywhere that takes JavaScript, you can already use CoffeeScript. Just that in the browser and in Node, it's a bit more convenient. And oh yeah, um, PlayFrame supports this, Rave supports this, uh, automatically, or PlayFrame is going to support this. Uh, the next version. Um, so you don't have to, to worry about compilation because basically, this is kind of bad practice. It's going to take a little while for the, the web page to compile it. So you, you probably want to send it pre compiled and and minifies and everything. Well, yeah, that's it. That's all for me. Thank you very much.